Warning, this show may contain some crude humor and mild swearing. Listener discretion is advised. The show was produced by Geek Happy Network, creators of the very best in audible oracle entertainment. In other words, podcasts. If you enjoy listening to The Smorgasbord, remember to subscribe to the show on Spotify or on your favorite podcast app. Remember to leave a review. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Smorgasbord! Welcome to Smorgasbord, a show where we explore the rituals, myths, and all things strange about the world of food. I'm Mick, and here with me today is Angel. Hello! And we got a couple special guests as well, I guess. Um, we have Brittany here. You can say hi if you want. Hi. She's playing with a lightsaber right now, so she's a little... Occupied. Occupied. <laughs> and we have Wanky here, who is... Yo! Playing with some <laughs> bubble heads. <laughs> but anyway, what are we talking about today, Angel? Portions. Portions, yeah. We're talking about American portions. Uh, just in case people don't know, we live in Canada, which is not America Junior. <laughs> though a lot of people seem to think so. Yeah. And we live in British Columbia, which is not in England. Right. Which... Nor in Colombia. Nor Columbia, yes, which people tend to confuse as well. But yeah, today we're going to talk about some portion sizes. I think it came up because one of our friends realized, or was wondering why North American sizes for food portions were so big compared to other countries. Where is your friend from? She's from the Philippines. Okay. Yeah. But this also applies to Europe. Yeah, Europe as well. I think like, I don't know, I went to Europe as well and I got food there and was like, okay, these are like pretty reasonably sized portions of food. Yes. Um, I felt good about it. I mean, just from looking at it, I used to think, this is tiny, <laughs> but yeah. it's actually fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, Angel, you came from LA and then moved to Canada, right? So yes. you would, would you know the difference? Like you probably noticed the difference when you moved. Did you notice the difference when you moved to Canada? Huge difference. Right? Or small. Okay. So it is much smaller in Canada. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, cause I, th- I think even the drink sizes. That's it's the one spe- thing I it's really actually, watched. especially the drink sizes. Yeah. I got a large drink and jack in the box the first time I crossed the border, and I was like, it's a bucket. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, when you live there, you don't realize yeah. how much soda you're consuming. Yeah, I could use that cup to bathe myself with water, <laughs> not not soda. Water. <laughs> That's a like after recipe drinking. for <laughs> ants. <laughs> but yeah, so I think today we're going to go through. I guess how what portion sizes are the origins a little bit of it and how it became so big and why North American portion sizes are so big. So yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so I guess to start with, we were trying to wonder what a portion size is. Um, by definition, I guess a serving size or a portion size is the amount of food of or the amount of a food or drink that is generally served. A distinction can be made between say a portion size or a serving size based on different reasons. So for example, a portion size is determined by external agents such as food, manufacturer, chef, or restaurant, or even a self-selected portion size in which you yourself choose or control over the portion in your meal or snack. Um, it can be determined by several factors like the palatability, palatability, the, the, of, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the palatability of a food and the extent to which it is expected to reduce the hunger and generate the sense of fullness. Um, it's very scientific. Yeah. When it comes to portion sizes, it generally can be measured in different ways. Um, bulk products are generally done in units of measurement, like a cup or a tablespoon, while commonly divided products like pies or cakes are obviously not divided or measured by units of measurement, more fractions, so like eighth of a cake, half a cake, blah, blah, blah. And some are just given the number, like if I'm going to get two slices of pizza or five olives or something. <laughs> <laughs> so you could measure portion sizes differently essentially is what we're trying to get at here and nothing it's all fancy very, here. very confusing because <laughs> I, I don't know is there an actual standard serving size so actually um no interestingly enough when it comes to you know in the the labels you get in food right like this nutrition facts label yeah so sometimes it'll say serving size there Serving size there shows actually how many servings are in a package and how big the serving is, right? 
So serving sizes are given from their measurements like a cup or a number of pieces like we mentioned a while ago. And you get all the nutritional, nutritional information on the label based on one serving of food. Now the thing I think that is interesting about this is that these serving sizes or servings of food aren't actually determined by nutritionists. So it's not actually like this is a healthy amount of one serving for you of chips, for example. The Do you want to guess where you think they get these serving sizes from if it's not from the nutritionists? Their butts? Because <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me. I know like for veggie straws, my fave, it's... Uh, I think it's like 67 straws right. is one serving. I'm like, yeah. how did you, why not make it 70? Why not a whole bag? Because I sure as hell eat the entire bag whenever I have, doesn't matter how big the bag is, yeah. <laughs> I eat it. Actually, interestingly enough, they get these numbers are averaged out from what is known in the industry as reference amounts of customarily consumed per eating occasion. So it's actually done based on how much of people eat per serving rather than what nutritionists say. So it comes from the average amount that Americans over the age of four consume in a single seating. Which is interesting. I can some... tell you 67 veggie straws is definitely not enough veggie straws. <laughs> well, it's average. I'm pretty sure you're like above, They're weak. <laughs> above average in that one. So how do they do the calculation? Just have a bunch of kids come in and just... <laughs> Eat and yeah, where can I get that job? job? <laughs> well, so apparently the average comes from federal food service, surveys. When the nutrition labeling on packages became standardized in 1994, the, the Department of Agriculture in the United States um, used answers from two nationwide health and nutrition examination surveys known as NHANES. <laughs> So what you're saying is they have a big wheel and it has number on it, and when they're doing packaging, they just spin it and, <laughs> and 67. <Now> they, <laughs> next. I, I wish they did, uh, but from what it looks like is they would survey a bunch of different people about how much they would eat of food and then base their survey, serving sizes on that. So for everyone to know, when the nutrition label says that's your serving size, it's not actually what nutritionists say it is, although it's called the nutritional facts sheet. It's... Just based on the average a consumption of, of America. Yeah, it is a sack of lies. That okay. makes me feel better when I eat like a whole bag of chips now. <laughs> it says like your serving size is like three chips. <laughs> you don't know my life. Yeah, but it's kind of weird when they like, I know this, I've seen some potato chips too who are like serving size of 10 chips. I'm thinking, who the heck just sits down and eats 10 chips? <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I don't like potatoes. Mm. But I know veggie straws is made of potatoes, but it's different. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Yeah, so um, that's kind of a little bit of the information on serving sizes and portion sizes. Um, when it comes to portion sizes, it never used to be as big as it was today. Um, for instance, I think, for example, a good example of this, I think, would be if you ever go to an antique store and look through um, the different dinnerware that they would have there. So things that may look like a small teacup or a small... Um, goblet or whatever actually are just their wine glasses or coffee cups um, and just over time and over the past decades things just got bigger and bigger I mean, from people, there. people got a lot bigger <laughs> have you seen any of the victorian dresses i'm like is this for an adult person <laughs> it's so tiny things that would look like saucers to us now were actually side plates for them then a uh, good way to think about this is back in the day, back even in the 50s, um, plate sizes were about 9 inches in diameter. And would you want to guess how big they are today on average? 86. <laughs> <laughs> 16. Close. A little lower. 12. 14. That's what the difference 13. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so today it's about 13 inches. Now, it doesn't seem like it's a lot, right? Like, what would four inches of a difference B. But if you think about it, the wider... <laughs> <laughs> four inches matters. <laughs> That's true. Um, but also, if you think about how uh, circles work, the larger the diameter, the bigger the surface area. In fact, even if you add maybe an inch or two, you could almost double the surface area of a plate. So, for example, a plate with a nine-inch plate and an 11-inch plate with, say... Um, four ounces of pasta, for example, and a nine-inch plate, and four ounces of pasta and an 11-inch plate. I wish I had examples to show you, but if you try it out at home, which I highly recommend, you could realize the difference of how it would make that pasta look based on the plate size. And you have to eat all of it. Yeah. Um, so where 
the reason I think for historians, the reason that these portion sizes started getting bigger happened mostly around World War, the end of World War II. After the war, agricultural policies in the United States expanded, and farmers were able to grow more food more efficiently by using fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, essentially technology made it easier to make food production happen. Cheaper ways to produce food made it easier for the United States government and people to ask for more food to be made. More food to be made made it so that we could make more food to be packaged and sold to people. So, but in the 1970s, the government began subsidizing farmers even to grow more food. More food means they could serve more food on bigger plates. Bigger portions of food, especially after World War II, was also then seen as a domestic luxury for people readjusting to life back home. Because obviously when you were fighting in the trenches, it's not like <laughs> it was you didn't, you didn't have a lot of food or whatever back then in the war. So coming back home and being able to see all that food became a sign of luxury for them. Um, and then having refrigerators and technology like microwaves made it easier to store food, made it easier to heat food and all of that made it that just having more became better. America. Yeah, right? Um, but also another factor of it is marketing and the creation of marketing in the United States, right? Back in the 50s when the advertising age started kicking in, food as food became cheaper to produce, it also meant that more companies wanted to sell more of it. Um, and a big way of doing that is pricing, pricing and packaging strategies to make it that you feel consumers could feel like they're getting more bang for their buck. So companies would choose to take advantage of this. Um, think about pricing strategies, right? The easiest example I always go through with this one is think of sodas. When you buy in 7-Eleven, it'd be like 79 cents for the smallest one and then 89 cents for the next level. And then the biggest one would be like twice the size of the smallest, but it would be only 30 cents, cents more, yeah. right? It's that 30 cent difference, but yet you get two times more. It's almost like they're pushing you to just buy the bigger one because you're getting more value for your money. Pricing pricing strategy 101 for people. Um, there's this... There. Um, I remember in LA, it's very, very easy to eat very horribly. Yeah. Um, when I first moved here, I couldn't understand how frozen dinners were so expensive here. Yeah. Compared to America. I used to get stacks of, like, Michelinas. Like lasagna, Michelinas. it's just a frozen TV dinner. Oh, okay. You can get 10 for $10. Yeah. Which is quite a bit of frozen, disgusting pasta. Yeah, for 10 but, bucks, right? But I think they're about like one for about five or six bucks here. Yeah. So, yay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's crazy to think. So it's like five times more expensive in Canada than mm -hmm. it would be if you bought it in LA. But I think a big part of it too, which is the one thing I didn't really look into is I'm assuming a I know Canada is so highly regulated when it comes to food production. Like there are certain restaurants I know from the Philippines that have a hard time coming into Canada. It's not because they don't have the money, but more <laughs> their food practices don't really fit the Canadian regulations. Um, compared to the United States, where it's so, it's much more free, I guess. It's very much capitalistic. Yeah. Because yeah. I compare yeah. McDonald's, for example, is a big example. Oh, of yeah. It. Like <laughs> the junior chicken here, I could eat. But, like, the junior chicken in the States are just so gross. They taste horrible. Yeah. Like, McDonald's was a big difference, too. Yeah. Like, when I first came here, I'm like, oh, I only eat McDonald's if I'm completely desperate. Yeah. But then I had a bite of something, I don't know, and it was actually edible. Yeah, right? McDonald's in Canada is good. And I keep telling my friends, I'm like, McDonald's is not bad here. Yeah. Try it. They're like, ew, no. Yeah. I can't eat, I can't even look at McDonald's in the States. I guess I've seen a burger there once. I'm like, that's paper. <laughs> but I think a big part of it has to do with regulation, and obviously it allows the states to produce yeah. cheaper food as well. Because yeah, of that. and that's how they produce so much of it. Yeah. And we've all seen the horror chicken farms documentaries. Yep. yep. Yeah. Um, so I guess in relation to that and pop and all of that, Coca-Cola is another good example of showing how marketing became a factor in increasing, increasing portion sizes. At the beginning of the Great Depression, Coke was generally served as a six-ounce bottle for a nickel. Um, six ounces would be... A lot. A lot, yes. yes. But it would be like half a bottle of beer. Or half a... It's a half a pint of beer. Because beer is 12. So Coke bottle back then for a nickel. I mean, a nickel is still super cheap for six ounces of that. But it's like half a bottle. It's like about... I'm yeah. holding my hands. <laughs> so I Matt, now like, realize that's a mistake you, for a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think for everyone to 
for reference, think about a pint of beer is six is twelve ounces. So half a pint of beer. So half a pint of beer. Also, like a small coffee is eight ounces. Yeah. So it's slightly smaller. Yeah, slightly smaller. She's so... gesturing with her hand again. <laughs> I'm just gonna wear some oven mitts. Yeah. And sit on my hands. But yeah, so think about it that way. That was the that was the serving size of a coke back then, and during the great the beginning of the Great Depression, so that was about twenties. This changed in 1934, though, when this little company, which I don't, I'm not sure if you guys know this one, Pepsi Cola, is another. Co- Never heard of them. Yeah, mm-hmm. pretty popular now, I think. Mm. <laughs> they decided to start selling 12 ounce bottles for the same nickel price as a six ounce Coke. Coke. Um, a big reason for that is because the product itself isn't expensive. You can just sugar water. Mm, it's sugar water, exactly. Um, distribution, bottling, advertising account for most of the company's costs while adding more to the product was cheap enough. So they were able to make a 12 ounce bottle without having to increase their costs and margins too much. In addition, the 12 ounce size allowed Pepsi Cola to use the same bottles as beer makers. Like we mentioned 12 no, ounces no. is a pint. A pint. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which actually allowed them to cut container costs because then they didn't have to make a special container for pop. They could just use the beer bottles. Pepsi's because of that, Pepsi's sales then soared and made even it, and they even made a jingle for it. Pepsi Cola hits the spot. Are you, are you gonna sing it? I don't know how the singing part goes. And, okay, you can just read it dramatically. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Pepsi Cola hits the spot. Twelve full ounces. That's a lot. Twice as much for a nickel. I already butchered it. <laughs> it goes Pepsi Cola hits the spot. Twelve full ounces. That's a lot. Twice as much for a nickel. To Pepsi Cola's the drink for you. I would wrap this. Uh, just, I right, try it. You want to yes. try it? Wait, can we both do it? <coughs> I need to do it. Where is it? Right Someone lay down there. the beat. <laughs> yeah, where's the beat? I don't know. Beat. beat Pepsi beat. Cola hits the spot. <laughs> <laughs> 12 full ounces. That's a lot. Twice as much for a nickel, too. Oh, man, a nickel. Yeah, Those right? Oh, wait. Pepsi Cola is a drink for you. Uh, don't right? have a career as a wordsmith. No. It's a good try, though. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, nickels no, are crazy. I mean, like, Nickelodeons were nickel-priced yeah. films. So if you talk about inflation, now we paid, like, 20... I, know, I paid almost 40 bucks for two tickets for the Avengers today, so... Yikes. That's cheaper than what I paid. Did you did you go, like, full no, IMAX? Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they serve then. churros to you at your seat. <laughs> <laughs> no, we ordered, like, pizza... Ginger beer and oh, wow. chicken wings. Nice. Oh. The VIP. That is VIP. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Have you tried it, Angel? The VIP. VIP, I have. Yeah, yeah. This... And I didn't know that you can order at your seat. Yeah, you could. I've never been. They have people like standing. Treated like a princess yeah. before. Yeah. You should go there in full robe. <laughs> I will have yeah. a twelve ounce coke. <laughs> could I bring my own bell? If I disturb the patrons. <laughs> But yeah, so that's essentially it, right? So 12 ounces for a nickel, Pepsi started selling it. Obviously, eventually, Coke sales plummeted because t- um, Pepsi sales rose. And by the 50s, they finally responded. Um, in 1955, the 10 and 12 ounce king size Coke bottles hit the market along with a 26 ounce family size, which I guess would be close to our two liter bottle at this point. Um, the trend toward larger sizes occurred in all sectors of the market, even when Coca-Cola parted with McDonald's in the 50s. The fountain soda at the restaurant became um, approximated into about seven ounces, and that was in the 50s. By the 60s, it turned into 16 ounces, and then it hit 21 ounces by 1974. So we're thinking a pitcher is about 64 ounces. I think now the states have like 32 ounce drinks, drinks or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this continues on to today. So as you can see, marketing also helps with making things bigger because bigger, there's this whole idea in the States about bulk, right? Buying things in bulk, the bulk culture. If you buy more for a better price, buying more for what is seen to be a cheaper price makes people feel like it's cheaper. Are we talking about Costco? Yeah. Yep. Costco is yeah. a big example of this, right? Because you don't really see Costco in non Americanized countries like the Philippines has these big ass um, what are they called like what are they called wholesaling like, wholesaling sort of, sort yeah. of wholesale, but not really who really needs 50 buns yeah 
Only if you're throwing a party. Nobody does. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. If you really if you're throwing like a buns. party, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, but because of this average size of foods just became becoming bigger and bigger. In fact, since the 1970s, it's increased by almost 138% is the average size of foods. Of course, the portion size comes with increased calorie intake as well for people. So the average calories for Americans in the 1970s is about 2,100. Today, do you want to guess how much they take per calories? God, no. Daily? It's not that high. It's actually. not that high? Yeah. Well, it's higher, but I was surprised it wasn't like... 3,000. Lower. Lower? Yeah, right? Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm surprised. So no, to, what is it? Yeah, today it's about 2,600 or almost 2,700 calories per day, which is only about five or 600 calories more, but it's still five or 600 calories yeah. more. If you factor in how behaviors of Americans today are more sluggish, or they don't, what are you, sedentary? Sedentary. sedentary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then you could see how much this re- really affect the increase of obesity. There are some parallels, obviously, with dinner plate sizes growing and obesity rates in the States, but obviously we can't really say it's causational, but it's, the evidence Factor. is fairly suggestive about that. A big problem about all of this today is that, as we mentioned, or as you could hear by the dates I was giving, 1930s, 1950s, 1970s, and today, these are like 40, 50 year increments. So these changes don't happen overnight, right? It takes 50 years, for example, to increase a plate size by an inch. It happens so slowly then that nobody really notices it, so that by the time it happens, we didn't even really realize that our sizes got bigger. So think about, a good way to think about it now is that the one chicken piece we eat, for example, today would have been about two pieces of chicken for our grandparents. You mean the chickens themselves are smaller? Yeah, or like cookie sizes or all of that. So I'm actually going to go through some size differences of different products from 20 years ago. For example, a bagel was about three inches in diameter 20 years ago. Today, it's about six oh, it's inches. It's a mini donut. Yeah, right. <laughs> but that's a huge difference because, like I mentioned, that's any, a lot of dough. Yeah, and any increase in the diameter of a circular circle, thing, circular thing mm-hmm. isn't um, what do you call it? It's not linear. It's like exponential. No, so you're just trying to mm-hmm. math me. And, uh, <laughs> I'm making I graph you. signs to Angel. I don't think people see that. Um, a muffin, for example, as well, went from about 210 calories or 1.5 ounces to about 500 today, which is about four ounce muffin. So we used to have muffins that were like more than mm-hmm. half the size. Less than half the Unless, size. I love mini muffins. So yeah. I actually prefer buying those to bigger muffins. Because the muffin tops are the best parts. Yeah. Yeah. More muffin tops. Yeah, those Costco size, <laughs> speaking of Costco, Costco yeah. size muffins, it's like the size of my yeah. face. So, <laughs> um, I don't think bro- anyone can ever finish one by themselves. The Costco muffins. Oh, I've seen it. Like, I've seen it. Seen it. Really? Yeah. I, I could never, but I've <laughs> definitely seen people I've done do it. that. Yeah. Oh, brave souls. It's painful. Fire stomach. Yeah. Um, cheeseburgers are another example where it used to be 333 calories up to 590 now pasta almost or doubled from 500 calories to 50 to a thousand calories um, now is it because they started adding more sugar or more like uh, high fructose yes and it's also everything? it's both that and serving sizes as well like i think when i went to italy recently the pasta sizes we got there were so tiny compared to what we get here but they were so filling i already got my days or meals worth of food from that size but yet in the states or here when i go to an italian restaurant here it's like three or four times bigger than what they give us in italy so and i still finish both of them so we'll talk a little bit about the psychology of that later on um fries is another example where it used to be about 2.4 ounces per serving now it's about 6.9 ounces Soda, as we mentioned as well, went from about 6 ounces to 20 ounces now. Um, coffee is a big one because I think people oh, tend guilty. to... Yeah. <laughs> I think a big part of it too, I think, is that the the, the, ver- the birth of Starbucks and this fancy-ass coffee culture, right? So back in the day, 45 calorie for an 8-ounce coffee spiked up to 330 calories for 16 ounce. And I'm assuming it has a lot to do with... The amount of sugar and the amount of milk that people put in their coffees today, while before it was more traditionally known to be like one or two cups, like, or one or two servings of sugar, or even just black coffee. Like I have most of my family, actually my whole family drinks black coffee, for example. 
Wow. Um, by the way, I know a lot of people. Harsh. Who, yeah. I know someone who does seven and seven. What's seven and seven? So seven cubes of sugar and What? Seven. What? Yeah. Into what size coffee? To a large, to a medium one. That's what? too much sugar. <laughs> well, there's a, I think there's a basketball player who does like 12 and 12. It's just some crazy number. Holy crap. It's like, do you even put coffee in that one? <laughs> Uh, yeah, right? But that's, I think that's a general, I mean, if you think about Tim Hortons, right? The, the typical Tim Hortons coffee is a double double. Yes. Not a black. Yeah, coffee. but not a seven. seven no. Seven by seven. <clears throat> but the standard has become that you put sugar and in milk instead of just drink your coffee on its own. Yeah, but it's like, like what are you trying to prove, Mick? <laughs> well, my point here was that the, the, I think maybe back in the day, people didn't really put stuff in their coffee. Not much stuff. <laughs> yeah, and now it's like a standard to just put a lot of stuff in the coffee. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it. It's just that the calorie, the consumption habits have made it that we have One thing about cup sizes. Intakes. So I drive a 1995 car. Yeah. And my cup holder literally cannot hold anything bigger than a small size. Really? Small size. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. a good, so that's a good point. In 95, I guess that could have accommodated a size large. Yeah. Back then? But no, not anymore. No. And my car is a 2019, and I can't even put a small cup of coffee. You know, I can't even put a McDonald's large in my coffee holder because it wiggles too much and spills my coffee. Oh, so it's looser. Yeah. Wow. It's planning for the future. It's my, I think, was it Eo was showing me this car guy review and part of the review is whether a car could take small cups of coffee <laughs> that's important information it is <laughs> but not really i'm realizing never drink yeah. small coffee <laughs> but then there's a market for other things like they have stuff now that you can add into your cup holder yeah. to fit for smaller cups yeah yep. but you can't go bigger you can go smaller no. yep so my car is just if you have a coffee you're holding it <laughs> you need like a big <laughs> um funnel thing <laughs> to get your thing to work um I was also looking up this article from The Guardian that talks about recommended portion sizes. To give reference, they gave some common household items to show how big. The recommendation, for example, of 180 grams of potatoes is actually just the size of a computer mouse. Um, when they talk about 80 grams of lean meat, that just means it's the size of a deck of cards. <laughs> no, okay. Which is not even... It's smaller it's than a patty. <laughs> Burger patty, yeah. if you think about it that way. Um, 150 grams of pasta and rice is actually just equivalent to a matchbox. That's like cooked enough. or uncooked? I would say uncooked oh. at this point, because it does sound kind of weird. <laughs> it's because it's a little, yeah. a little hamster plate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Um, and 25 grams of crisps, which I think is British. What's crisps? Or it's chips. Chips. chips, right? Okay. It's just a regular sized mug. Um, so these are just some references of like how much the portion sizes should be and how much we probably don't eat that way. <laughs> we eat probably. I don't for sure. <laughs> or five times that. Yeah. Um, and we're talking about changes as well. Ready-made meals became a big part of this as well because obviously all these ready-made meals came without having a lot of preparation coming from the consumer side of things. So we just buy these things. And they've also increased the sizes of these things as well. So chicken pies in... England, for example, are expanding by 49%, and an average shepherd's pie has nearly doubled in size since 1993. Um, wow, the good old 90s. Yeah. I bet that shepherd's pie could have fit in my cup holder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> could be. Oh, we have more oh, we guests. Have more guests. More guests. Hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> Yeah, so, so in relation to one of the quotes I found, it said, uh, it is human nature to eat when presented with food. And to eat more when presented with more food. That's uh, very true. It's me. I would get that keychain. <laughs> <laughs> You'd get that tattooed as a yeah. tramp stamp. <laughs> We're still talking Wouldn't about you want to put it in the front? Yeah. <laughs> or in the Wait, stomach? Right here. <laughs> oh, here? <laughs> On your neck. <laughs> yeah, could be. Um, I also tried to look about portion sizes across the world to see whether or not it's only an American thing. But it does seem to be across the board that portion sizes in general have been increasing. In fact, the only really people who are immune to big portions are tiny children or kids under four. Up until the age of three or four, ch children have the enviable ability to stop eating when they are full. I don't think I did. <laughs> My Honestly. nephew doesn't. He's a fat child too. Yeah, he used to eat, eat so eat, many eat. McDonald's, yeah. I think he eats more than I do. Yeah. Um, well, maybe for him it was younger. 
um, because after about that age, the self-regulation of hunger is lost and it's really never relearned. It's a, and apparently this is a cross-cultural phenomenon from London to Beijing. The one factor I did find that limited the way people consume food is actually comes from tradition. So the idea of shared knowledge between people through a culture can mean serving sizes can still stay the same. For instance, there's a 2010 survey where they uh, surveyed about 1,500 elderly people from South Korea and found that almost all of them in that group agreed that the portion, their portions of food were about more or less the same. It was 75 grams of rice, 120 grams of sweet potato, 40 grams of spinach, and a gram of white, roasted white sesame seeds. The speculated root for why all of them had the same belief is that it all came from tradition. It was a tradi I'm not Korean or anything, so I can't speak to it, but I would assume that a lot of Korean families had rooted in their culture or tradition to be able to eat. This is the kind of meal they would eat regularly. So then it became that a lot of them ate the same similar way compared to Western cultures where now every family has their own identity or everyone wants to be their own thing and have their own different eating rituals and they're at the mercy of the food industry who will dictate what they want to eat or what they can eat. So that was the only difference I could find across the world when it came to like portionings, I guess. Another difference that I found when it came to food choices, though, came in supermarket options. So the average American supermarket stocks about 40,000 unique items, while in Europe, do you want to guess how much less? Half of that. Less than half. Yeah. A third. It's about 18,000 items. I don't know what that is in math. Less than half. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, moreover, U.S. stores are on average twice the size of their European equivalents. Now, obviously, this could be because of space as well. Europe as a continent is much smaller than the whole of America's. Or, so I don't know whether that's the reason or whether it is because of the obvious American consumption of food. Well, American grocery stores are much bigger than they are here, too. True. I was just yeah. talking to my friend about this. I was complaining about the lack of cereal choices in Canada. <laughs> And how there's no Fruity Pebbles here, but they also don't have right. a whole bunch of other cereals that I remember right. that I used to like. Yeah, fair enough. And I'm like, huh, this cereal aisle is kind of minimalist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, something Actually, I'm going to I don't even after. really like cereal, which is weird, <laughs> but I, just, I really wanted some Fruity Pebbles. <laughs> what are Fruity Pebbles? They're is sugar. They're, like they're rainbow sugar. They, oh. They're like Flintstone. Are they Flintstone? There's it some kind of sounds like a Flintstone. Yeah, yeah. Flintstone yeah. Yeah. tricks. Yeah, yeah cool. they're just fruity and they're flaky. They're kind of like uh, like if a frosted flake <laughs> had a baby with Fruit Loops. Oh wow. Yeah, but they're much smaller flakes. Huh. We we'll have to look this up. Delicious. Yeah. Are we going Made magically trip? delicious. Wait, what cereal is that? That's, that's the rabbit. No, no, no that's, that's the leprechaun. That's oh. the leprechaun. Lucky yes. Charms. Right? Lucky Charms. Yeah. See, I the never leprechaun. ate any of this growing up, so I don't know. We have to do an episode about cereal and call them cereal killers and talk about the... Cereal chillers. Yeah. Ooh. Wait, can we yeah. just do a road trip and go buy cereal? Sure. Okay, cool. Just Who's wanted... eating it, Angel? <laughs> I just want fruity pebbles. I will eat them. I think a big part of it as well, then is that idea of shopping for things in bulk is more of an American concept. So having multiple options, bigger options, all of it in the supermarket do kind of relate to this as well. This is a personal belief of mine, but I think it roots back to the belief of getting your money's worth when buying more. Um, in reality, according to Fast Company, though... I uh, buying... you going to say, according to Fast and the Furious. <laughs> vroom, vroom. According to Vin Diesel. <laughs> no, um, according to Fast, um, buying in bulk can actually tend to be more expensive. Um, a big reason for it is waste. So Victoria Leg Legon, Victoria Legon, a researcher at the University of Arizona, said that people in this country, the United States, are very price sensitive at the grocery store, but tend to overlook the cost of discarded or unused food at home. Um, Barcelona, and for example, compared to this in Barcelona, for example, people tend to just buy food in fresh produce market. Ugh. in fresh produce markets or local stores every day. So they would just buy their food every day rather than once a week. While in America, they have this idea of bulking so you can buy for the week. I mean, part of it is laziness as well, right? Which leads to a lot of waste. I think it's waste. a work thing too. Since in yeah. America, they work a whole lot more. For sure. For so sure. You don't have time to go to the store every day. For sure. Yeah. I think that's a big part of it too. Um, interestingly enough, when I used to do research on food waste, Canada is... A higher waster of food than America is. 
Really? Yeah. Oh, that's surprising. It takes us longer to get to a grocery store. Could be, yeah. Like, more Canadians are harder pressed to do that, but we do waste more food by consume. Consumers tend to waste more food than American consumers do when it comes to grocery products. But I would also argue that Canadians, there's a trend towards healthier food, which has mm-hmm. less of an expiration date. So the yeah. amount of time that you have to finish that food is quicker. Yep. Ergo, like you're throwing out much more often. For sure. Or if you're buying organic. For sure. And I think on top of that, too, a big reason, I believe, or my theory was because of the way the um, waste management is done here in Canada, where we almost assume that composting is a good thing. We think, oh, if I have wasted food, I could just compost it anyway. So it's not like I'm hurting the environment too much. So it becomes this idea of um, using up your waste, or not thinking of it as waste, but rather something as like, oh, I could just give it back right. to the compost. Um, but yeah, there are many theories to that. Um, a big part of the United States is that they don't potentially not think about bulk, buying bulk and using thinking of the waste when they buy the bulk. It also has a lot to do with how they package. Like, in Europe, usually, when we went to buy eggs, they will only sell you six. Yeah. So you, and then here, 12 is minimum, unless you really search for that six. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was my struggle to buying stuff here in the groceries. I can't buy stuff for myself. A lot of things in groceries are designed to be bought for families or to be bought for the week. Like, I can't even buy a sprig of parsley. It drives me (laughs) <laughs> you have to buy a yeah. bushel. It's like, I'm not making tabula. I can't. What am I going to do with all this parsley? I need one spring for my chicken. That is um, true. I've had the parsley problem before. Yeah, right? Um, my guess, too, is also that buying more also makes us want to consume more, so we end up spending more. So if we end up buying things in bulk, we are forced to buy or want to eat more. And if we want to eat more, then we consume more of the food. By that, then we'll end up buying more food in the future or whatever. So we replenish food much faster because we're ending up buying more food. Um, so in relation to that, that's why bulk buying could also become more expensive for people. Um, and I also started looking into, so what if portion sizes are so big? Obviously, if we want to eat, we want to eat. But obviously... We all know, I think, and a lot of people know that a big reason why portion size is becoming so big as a problem is that it also contributes to being overweight. Um, in 2014, it's shown that I think a lot of people already know that the United States is the most obese and overweight country in the world, which accounts for 13% of all the overweight and obese people in the world. So Americans take up 13% of all the overweight and obese people in the world. And this is crazy because the United States only takes up 5% of the world's population. Now, there are about 160 million Americans who are either obese or overweight. Nearly three quarters of them are men and, oh wait, sorry. Nearly three quarters of American men or more than 60% of women are obese or overweight, which I think is a surprising number. Like It's really high. 75% of American men are overweight or obese? I believe it. <clears throat> really? Yeah. Jeez. You should... I drove up here from LA when I moved, and as soon as you're out of like a metropolitan city, people got bigger and bigger. Right. And fair enough. But yeah, you're, that's just, still like on the West Coast side. That's not even looking at like Middle right. America or Texas or the South. So if they're yeah, increasingly getting larger <clears throat> on the coasts, you can imagine. Right. Yeah, fair enough. Um, would you want to guess who the second and third place? In terms of total number. I think England number. had a big obesity problem. Am I right? No. No. <laughs> well, then. Think like <laughs> countries with the most populations. China? China. China. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. So China follows as a distant second with 46 million people who are obese and India with 30 million who are obese. Now, a big part of it, obviously, is that it's 46 million of 2 billion people in China, right? And 30 million of 2 billion people in India. So... When it comes to percentage-wise, it's really not that much. I don't know what that is. I didn't do the math. I didn't write down the math either, so I actually mm-hmm. know what that means. But even though they do represent 15% of the world's obese population, when it comes to total number in China who are obese, it's like 1% or 2%, I think, compared to the States, which it's about... I, can't, I don't do the math. I think it's like half. Oh, sorry. Yeah, about half. half. Yeah, more yeah. than half of Americans are obese, so... 
China and India get second and third place just because they have Sheer a lot number. of people. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, now the reality of why obesity obviously is a problem, as we know, is it because it does increase the risk for many health-related diseases. Which makes me really think, if healthcare is privatized in the United States, does healthcare really have an incentive to minimize obesity and right overweightness in America? Because then if more people are bigger, that means more people need healthcare which then funds the healthcare industry of the United States. So the very people who are supposed to be responsible for making Americans healthy don't really have an incentive if they're privatized to do... Oh, no, no not at all. Yeah. It's Just not crazy their prerogative. To yeah. So sad. <laughs> and they don't want to insure people. No. Which is funny, because don't you want to insure more people to collect more money? You think, right? But I guess because medical care is so expensive. Procedures. Yeah. That it's worth it to not. Yeah, you might as well. I mean, I think it'd be interesting to do a study into medical. I mean, obviously, it's not the field of our podcast, but it'd be interesting to look at the medical side of obesity and whether or not healthcare industry. Really... Only if you have a universal healthcare. Yeah. I don't know how that works for them. I don't think it worked that well, right? No, it doesn't. No. I was uninsured when I was there, but that was before ah, Obamacare. Yeah, so when, when we look into that, um, there was a study by the Journal of the American Academy of Nutrition and Diet... Dietetics? Diet... Diastetics? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Where they looked at Di meals served... Dietetics? Dietetics, yes. Did oh. I say that right? I have no idea. <laughs> Dietetics, yeah, okay. <laughs> they looked at meals served at about 123 restaurants in three cities across America. The result came out that single meal servings, that's just one meal, no drinks, no appetizers, no desserts, literally one meal, exceeded the recommended calorie requirements for a single meal pretty much all the times, sometimes even exceeding an entire day's worth in one meal. Uh, researchers at John... Mayor, USDA Human Nutrition Research Center oh, on Mayor Aging at Tufts. Research Center? This is like a little... Oh, wonderland. Gene. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's Gene. I just missed it. <laughs> His cousin. <laughs> John Mayer's cousin, researcher at um, Gene Mayer, USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts University in Boston. <laughs> Jesus. What a mouthful. <laughs> you can't even... I don't even know how to acronym that. Anyway, they found that 92% of American restaurant meals, including meals at both chain and non-chain restaurants, would contain way too many calories. Um, yeah, guys, we need to, on this road trip, we need to go to BJ's. BJ's? BJ's. Ooh. What's that one? It's a, it's kind of like Cheesecake Factory. Oh, heck yeah. But um, they have the their world famous Pazuki. <gasps> oh. Is it like a panuki but better? It's like a pan, yeah, and then it's a cookie on the bottom. Yeah. Oh, put, it's like a better panuki. I've never heard of a panuki, but... Boston. So Boston Pizza has oh, okay. a thing they call panuki, which used to be a <coughs> cookie it's on It's called a, a pizuki. <laughs> but they got amazing. rid of it. Okay. We should go there. Yeah. Because we got a panuki at Boston Pizza. We have the whole pizza. American experience of eating at BJ's and looking at cereal aisles. <laughs> Done. Back to discussing Road obesity. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is a once-a-year <laughs> uh, once thing, <laughs> maybe. So, in part of that study, they looked into American, Chinese, Greek, Italian, Indian, Japanese, Mexican, Thai, and Vietnamese food. And would you want to guess which are the top three? For what? For what? For, what? For <laughs> highest calorie counts per single meal. Indian. Uh, I don't think any Italian. I, I have no idea. Italian. 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 Indian. We got Indian, we got Italian. I've lost track of I forget. No, what were the other ones? American, Chinese. Oh, American. 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 Okay. okay, American's one of them. Italian's one of them. So there's one more between American, Chinese, Greek. Is it American Indian, Chinese or Italian. like OG Chinese? <laughs> uh, so American. And the second one is Chinese. The okay. third one is Greek. The fourth one is Italian. Fifth okay. one's Indian. Sixth one's Japanese. Seventh Mexican. Eighth Thai. Mexican. Oh. Seventh. Oh. Vietnamese. So, so what do you think is the like third? Like real Mexican, American Mexican, or like OG Mexican? <laughs> I will Mexican. assume that these researchers are white. <laughs> So it's like all the Americanized. So then every Chinese. kind of Mexican in quotation marks. Mexican. Mexican. Yeah. Actually Chinese. Yeah, Chinese. Oh, well, yeah, American Chinese. So American like Chinese. Chicken. Yeah. Yeah. So American Chinese. I was just gonna say hello, Taco Bell. And, yeah. And chop soy. I don't, yeah, even, I know, would assume, I don't even know what that yeah. is. I would assume under the Chinese category would be all forms of Chinese, including American Chinese. 
Yeah. Anyway. Well, <laughs> essentially, American Express. American food, Chinese food, and Italian restaurants or food were had the highest calorie intake counts mm-hmm. with a mean of about 1,495 calories per single meal. Again, oh, single meal. No appetizers, no drinks, no desserts, just that one order. Um, uh, the co-author, William Masters, PhD. He's, his last name's Masters, and he has a PhD. That's funny. <laughs> so he should have just stopped before the PhD. <laughs> uh, William Masters, PhD, a professor of food economics, explains... Standard meals are sized for the hungriest customers, so most people need superhuman self-control to avoid overeating. So essentially, again, going back to the quote from a while ago, it's human nature to eat when presented with food and to eat more when presented with more food. We could also take into account this overestimation of food because of how consumers don't really know how much to eat either. Think of the food trends in the past 15 years. How many of these trends change what they say about how much we need to eat? Then there's a matter of our love for food as well. Food also satisfies the need beyond just the quiet need of hunger. Think about social aspects of eating, such as family dinners, where your aunt or whatever will beg you to finish the last bit of food in the plate, or ask if you want dessert, even though your food stomach's already stuffed. Or think even about psychological reasons, like when I feel all shitty, all I want to do is eat. So there's so many aspects. Do you like to, to eat your feelings? Yeah, heck yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I try to like visualize my feelings into my meal sometimes. Um, Off topic. The closest BJ's is by SeaTac. Oh, sweet. That's not that far. It's like two and a half hours, right? Yeah. Ooh. Well, that well, is this traffic. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, researcher Brian Wansink describes... So, this researcher, actually, Brian Wansink... Wansink? Anyway. He has this book called Mindless Eating. He did a bunch of different experiments. It's super cool. I'd recommend people check it out. I haven't checked it out. I actually want to buy this book because it looks interesting. I but he does this. It. When you're done. Sure, yeah. He has this thing, which is a soup bowl experiment, where the subjects were asked to eat a bowl of soup and rate how full they felt. Now, the secret of the difference of the two subjects, the, the, one, the two groups, is that one of them was, one of the groups had their bowl secretly refilled from the bottom. Well, what kind oh. of magic bowl oh, is this? Right? <laughs> Crazy. Can I have it? <laughs> As they ate the soup. Um, what they found was people with a bottomless soup bowl ate 73% more soup. But they rated their satisfaction level exactly the same as other people. I like how they don't realize. Why is there more? Yeah. I'm sure they found, <laughs> a way, they found a way to make it not look obvious. But that's crazy for you to think that, like, that's why I was saying, like, in Italy, when I had the bowl of pasta versus the bowl here, which is four times more, I felt exactly as full for both sizes. It's maybe a lot your of. your plate had a thing that kept feeding you pasta. Maybe. <laughs> That'd be super magic, though, because they. Anyway. I don't know, have you ever been to like Anton's pasta? No. I look I like I barely made a dent in that. Right. It's huge. It's massive. We should try that. Okay. But yeah, because I it's closer than beaches. Yeah. <laughs> Jamoko's is only twenty minutes away. Ooh. It's get two for one prize of pasta. <laughs> I don't even eat pasta. But it was like a competition. <laughs> if you could finish yours, and you'd get really? like a free pen. Oh, a nice. pen. Yeah. <laughs> but it was like, it was actually a prize. And people oh, cool. tried to do it. And I was like, I I'll will never come close in my lifetime. Yeah. That's cool. For a pen? Yeah. <laughs> Is that a gel pen? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just a ballpoint. Oh. Um, another experiment he did was um, it showed the group that you'll eat more from a large container even if you don't even like the food. They replaced popcorn at movie theater with stale two-week-old popcorn. Now, people did Oh, I'd still eat that. I right? fucking love popcorn. Yeah. And people also stale even complained about how terrible the popcorn was. But even if they complained about it, they still ate about 35% more popcorn than those who were given a smaller container. <laughs> so it really is a big part of it is looking at the food that is in front of you. Um, so what now? Um, a lot of people have talked about different suggestions about how you could control your portion sizes and all of that. Someone says to sell small portions at higher prices, and I keep replying to them being like, dude, I'm broke. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that solution. No, it's a dumb sell- solution. Exactly. No, you can just sell smaller portions. Yeah. Is I erase it? their name so we don't make fun of them. Or- uh, yeah, okay. give us, just, just sell us one strand of parsley. Yeah. Exactly. Like, better portioning for people. Anyway. Except for coffee. Yeah, and don't yeah. add to the price. Yeah. And there was another one, my favorite kind of people who give you advice, saying, just be more attentive about the food you eat. Thanks. Yeah. So helpful. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not helpful at all. 
My what thing- about the problem of like your eyes are bigger than your stomach? As in, you think you can eat a lot more, so you right. order a lot more. Yeah, and that's then- my problem. Oh, I do that yeah. all the time. Yeah, that was my problem at lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's. I mean, and they do say a lot of it. I was reading more into like some of the psychological stuff. I didn't want to get too deep into it because I knew we had some guests and all of it, and didn't want to bore you guys with it. But there are a lot of psychological studies about how food isn't about to really your stomach. I mean, I think. After today, it's pretty clear that the stomach plays a small role about how our consumptions are behaved, like whether it comes from marketing, the industry, food industry, or even our emotional aspects. There's so many factors that affect, affect, <laughs> affect the large portion sizes we have for food today. It's nuts. But the one, I think someone mentioned this a while ago too, I think the easiest and simplest way really to help your food consumption, if you don't want to eat as much and limit your thing, is just use some, Smaller tableware. So we should all go buy kids. Yeah. Play sets. Sure. Cool. Well, I heard that too, and it like tricks your brain. Like if you take like a large piece of cake and put it on a small cake Mm -hmm. and eat it with a tiny fork, it's like you're forced to eat more bites. So you think mentally that you've eaten a lot more than you have. Yeah. As opposed to like American restaurants, I'm always like, why is this fork so big and so damn heavy? (laughs) My like tiny hands. Oh, for sure. (laughs) Yeah. And I did like even the time I studied like. I think it's called gastrophysics now. Like I was reading up a book about gastrophysics. That's a big part of it. It's a lot of restaurants play with every little factor in a restaurant from the weight of your spoon to the size of your plate. All of that does affect your restaurant experience. It's all designed to elevate your experience. If they give you a lot of food, they're going to make it look like it's eat, it's edible enough or sizable enough. So it does actually allow you to finish your food or enjoy your food. So a lot of, I mean, not obviously not every restaurant does, but higher, more woke restaurant. More know, woke. <laughs> but more and what more the happening? science behind food and all of that is being studied and being accepted by a lot of more restaurants today. So yeah, like you said, a heavier fork makes you feel like you're getting a bigger, I think they were saying something about like the heavier fork helps with like making your meal feel more fulfilling or whatever, even the color. And all of that. It's a really interesting book. I can't remember who the author is, but it's called Gastrophysics. I think it's really fun to read into that and how you could use that to trick your mind and your brain into either enjoying or not enjoying your food. There's also like free sampling. Yeah. Why do you think I bought the damn cake? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Marketing plays a huge role. I think, oh gosh, back when I was in advertising, pricing strategies was such a big thing because just how you price things is such a can affect how people buy things. Right? Yeah, one dollar drumsticks. Yeah. <laughs> we all fell for yeah, it. Yeah, they limited us to three. So, yeah, but see, know, their loss. Yeah, have bought twenty. <laughs> but the limit. They even say, for us, it's a marketing strategy to put the limit in, so people know they could get more, but you can't. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, They're like, time. oh. I can only get three, but I want more. Oh, so okay. it's forcing you to buy. It's making, you, it's tricking your mind into thinking. Oh, they don't know. But how they don't know how cheap I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not buying but more it than works for some sale amount. Like I, I know. Go outside, yeah. put on some fake glasses, and come back and buy three more. Yeah. Sure. We can return. Literally, they won't remember any of us. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, and that's by all means, but it's still more sales for them, right? Like I think when I worked in their grocery store, we never really we had like these big sales where we had limits to buy only four packs of whatever. We didn't really follow them. Nobody cared because it's like my boss was like, "Yeah, we just put that there so people will buy more." <laughs> oh, Superstore does that when they have a sale. Yeah. They only give you a minimum of four. I don't need four, but I bought four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the my other trick. thing too. Is you, I only wanted one piece of drumstick. I ended up buying two because I needed my limit was three. I wanted three and I got three. Yeah, and I ate three. It was great. Yeah, <laughs> and cool story, bro. <laughs> 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 but yeah so i guess there you have it that's our thing about sizes <laughs> i think i think we should uh go buy some baby plates yeah but buy baby plates everybody and baby forks go fill up those nurseries and sell them buy them dry <laughs> babies can't use forks <laughs> they use bottles don't they have like like one There's year old baby utensils. Baby. Yeah. Yeah. Are there? Sporks. Yes, sporks. Yeah, sporks. Oh my god, I love sporks. Oh, the thing with the knife. Spinorks. Spinorks. <laughs> yeah, so that, I mean, we usually end up, I mean, not usually is the second time we're doing this. <laughs> we te- Last time we ended our podcast with talking about what we were eating this week. Oh, I mean, I'm pretty sure we 
We all had chicken yeah, today. So all of us had Win Win fried chicken in Steveson, Steveson British Columbia. One dollar chicken thigh. But that was only sticks. this weekend, so right. don't prior get to that, we did yeah. have smoothies. So we oh, balanced we yeah. it. Balanced it. <laughs> oh, I had my like vegetables. Healthy smoothies. <laughs> yeah, we got we got our portion sizes right. But the price difference is crazy. You yeah. Know, one dollar drumsticks and a ten dollar <clears throat> smoothie. Yeah. But then again, then you're then you're looking to a whole other aspect of food and like healthy food and organic food versus the cost of cheap, like easily accessible food for the masses. Yeah. So it's like, do you shop more at like Whole Foods and Trader Joe's, or do you go to like yeah. No Frills and just stock up on whatever they have? Or Safeway and hang out with all the old folks. Do people still go to Safeway? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know where there is a Safeway. But anyway, yeah, that's wonderful. Definitely a no frills girl. Should we yeah. just go to Boston Pizza? Get no, a, I, I get a fake Pazuki. Yeah, they don't even because their Pinocchios don't even come in a pan now. It's just Ookies. Pinocchio. Yeah. Pinocchio. They don't have pans anymore. So sad. Anyway, thanks for listening, everyone. Eat less or more. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you do. Yeah, you do. This is Smorgasbord! Have a food-related ritual, myth, or something strange you want us to explore? Send us a message through Facebook at Geek Happy Network. We'd love to hear from our fellow foodie listeners. And while you're there, remember to subscribe or follow us too. This show was created by Angel Lynn and Mick Narciso. Hosted by Angel Lynn and Mick Narciso. Editing by Mick and logo by Angel. Thanks for listening. For more GHN shows like the Monster Slayer's Guide to Slaying Monsters, come give us a listen at geekhappynetwork.com or look for us on your favorite podcast app. Oh, and be sure to follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Geek Happy Network.